daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. Ukraine has continued to press on with a major incursion into Russia's Kursk region. The Ukrainian military claims to have destroyed pontoon bridges and engineering equipment in the region with U.S.-made rockets. These moves are part of an attempt to establish what President Vladimir Zelensky described as a military buffer zone inside Russian territory. Meanwhile, Moscow said its forces had halted Kyiv's advance in the region and gained ground in eastern Ukraine. Also, Russian air defenses shot down 11 Ukrainian drones targeting Moscow, marking one of the largest drone assaults on the capital to date. How does Ukraine's incursion into Russia alter the dynamics of the war? With the Kremlin ruling out peace talks following the Kursk attack, does this make the already distant prospects of peaceful negotiations even more unlikely? Furthermore, with Western weapons being used on Russian soil, how might this escalate the threat of a broader conflict between NATO and Russia? Joining our discussion today, Dr. Zhang Xin, Deputy Director of the Center for Russian Studies at East China Normal University. Hanan Hussein, co-founder and senior expert at Initiate Futures, an Islamabad-based policy think tank. And Professor Joseph Syracuse, Dean of Global Futures with Curtin University. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Professor Zhang, let me start with you. So uh, Zelensky has said that this incursion into Russian territory is aimed at creating a buffer zone. So what does that tell us about Ukraine's current strategy? Uh, it was a b- bit of a surprise to me and uh, probably to a lot of people who are following this um, ongoing um, military conflict for a while. Um, it would strike us uh, that uh, the Ukrainian uh, military and the Ukrainian government was uh, intended to actually create a buffer zone on the uh, Russian territory. Um, some people uh, expected the um, Ukrainian army this time would be um, uh, hit and run. Uh, take a hit it, hit it around uh, approach just to demonstrate they, they have the ability to um, uh, open up another uh, line of contact and uh, uh, cause sub- substantial um, uh, costs to uh, the uh, Russian military. Uh, that was uh, some people's uh, expectation. So I think the, the idea to create a buffer zone on Russian territory, uh, which means that um, <clears throat> Ukrainian army is going to hold uh, part of Russian, current Russian territory for uh, some time, at least some extended period of time. Um, regardless how large the uh, size of this uh, uh, territory will be. Uh, so this is, I think, a new um, tactic, uh, something a lot well, most people probably didn't uh, expect it uh, in, in the first place. And uh, I think that also demonstrates uh, Ukraine side uh, would like to take this um, uh, uh, as a chance to boast relief some uh, of the pressure uh, it has been um, uh, receiving on the um, uh, Donbass region, in the Donbass region and uh, uh, around uh, Kharkov, and also create probably a more favorable um, uh, conditions for any possible uh, political negotiation uh, this year. Okay, so Professor Syracuse, uh, what do you think are the primary objectives of Ukraine's incursion into Russia? Uh, like, is it about gaining more leverage at the negotiating table or to test Russia's military capability or maybe to send uh, an even broader message to both Moscow and the international community? What do you think? Well, as a professional historian of um, diplomacy over many, many years, I my first inclination was to uh, think about this as a bargaining chip or a diversionary measure to uh, put pressure on Russia or maybe even uh, put pressure on that nuclear base in, um, in, in Russia I mean, or in the Chris nuclear power plant. Now, there are all kinds of possibilities, but look, it's, it's not going to be a diversion. I mean, the Russians are not going to uh, remove troops in the Donbass area to go to this place. Uh, uh, they're going to be able to defeat the uh, Ukrainians at their own uh, at their own time and, uh, and reckoning. I think. Uh, also, it's it's not going to uh, do anything except exacerbate uh, uh, relations between uh, Russia and Ukraine as we got very close to some kind of a peace deal or you know at least a diplomatic negotiation. 
I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was kind of, uh, it's very inventive. Uh, maybe it was designed to scandalize uh, Putin to put him on the defensive, but I think it was pretty far-fetched. Uh, the, the thing is, is that um, it just delays the day of reckoning. Now, just finally here, I think uh, this, this particular opening front had almost nothing to do with Zelensky and had a lot to do with the American government. So uh, I think uh, the, uh, the American government, particularly NATO, is all over this kind of thing. They're using mechanized uh, units to go into this place, which looks an awful lot like somebody, somebody else's plan over, over the years. And I, and I think um, the Biden administration is throwing everything it can at Putin to d- delay the day of reckoning. Okay, so um, Dr. Hussein, um, in your opinion, to what extent has Ukraine's strategy been effective in reducing the threat of Russian airstrikes targeting Ukrainian territories? And, and how, how exactly does that affect Russia's ability to sustain its military operations in Ukraine? So I think um, when you talk about Ukraine's ability to proceed um, with a greater sensitivity towards its interests, I think uh, it creates enough uncertainty for Putin and for Moscow uh, broadly uh, to ensure that uh, they would want to proceed with an offensive, but also try to limit the concessions they make on the defensive front. So I think in terms of that, um, that, uh, that mixed signaling, I think Ukraine's offensive kind of uh, leads to enough diversion on Russia's front to to say, okay, this is the the biggest attack on Russian uh, soil uh, since World War II, and um, in order for Russia to kind of maintain and signal a, a stronger stance in this, you know, broad invasion, would have to then at some point uh, put a huge lid on uh, Ukraine's ability to kind of advance and go forward. And I think to some degree, we do see uh, Ukraine's ability to use it as a bargaining chip uh, become a bit of a weak strategy. Um, I'll give you two rationales for that. First of all, uh, when you look at the way Ukraine has proceeded, uh, the the offensive overall is slowing down. And we also know that there's a lot of pressure on Ukraine to maintain and uh, strengthen its forces on the Eastern Front, which Russia is on the verge of capturing again. So when you look at those fronts, I think um, there's greater pressure on Ukraine, which already has been, uh, you know, trying to muster a strong enough counteroffensive to signal that they're in a position to bargain on their own terms. But as far as Putin goes, I think uh, Moscow is going to buy its time, and then it would basically look for uh, a way through which it can proceed deep into Ukrainian territory but prevent any more concessions on ground on Russian territory to Ukraine. Okay, but uh, Dr. Hussein, what do you make of Russia's response to the Ukrainian attacks so far? Like, we are seeing that Russia looks like it has struggled to effectively repel this incursion. Why is that? Yeah, several factors. I think, uh, first of all, uh, Russia was just caught off guard. Um, When you look at the governor's statements as well, you look at uh, the politicians on ground, the local forces, they had no idea. I mean, Ukraine's Western allies, many of them had no idea. So I think it was the nature of the response as well. Secondly, I think when you look at Kurs, uh, it was thinly guarded to begin with. Um, It was uh, a strong enough target for Ukraine because Russia obviously did not expect uh, an attack, which included uh, a strong mix of, for example, uh, organized ambush. You had uh, a lot of these these armored vehicles going forward at a time when Ukraine was looking to capture these settlements um, in one go. Um, So when you look at the nature of the attack and the fact that we haven't seen something like this for the past few years, Russia was caught complacent politically, and uh, we do see uh, much of that panic reflect in Russia's uh, ability to then send its reinforcements to kind of dial down the temperature in this. So I think lack of preparation was one. Um, Secondly, I think when you look at Ukraine's strategy overall, I think uh, Russia's rhetoric and rationale until now has been that it wants to engage battalions uh, in further offenses uh, within Ukraine, and if it does not you know, succeed in capturing a whole lot of territory, retaining it, uh, the uh, the rationale then for their uh, reinforcement was that, um, you know, Russia could then freeze uh, the way, the trajectory in which this war was going. So we do know that Russia going deep into Ukrainian territory was one thing, but the nature of the attack, the pace of it, and the fact that Russia hasn't witnessed something like this for the past two years, collectively contributed to a failure which now Putin is trying to signal politically as something that um, was blamed on his security forces or something for which he does not take direct blame for now. So there's a bit of a domestic political cost when it comes to Putin's backers and the kind of uh, trust 
the important Putin until we do see a reaction uh, coming from him in, in the coming weeks. Okay, so uh, Professor John, uh, what do you make of Russia's response so far, and and how do you view this Ukrainian incursion in the broader context of the war? Well, first, I um, agree with uh, uh, Dr. Hussein's um, uh, major point that uh, uh, the attack caught Russians off guard, and also the Kursk region, uh, the borderline is uh, thinly uh, has been thinly defended. And to add some details on it, uh, the, the that part is um, mostly guarded on, on the Russian side by um, uh, border guards and uh, uh, the National Guards, Roskavadia, uh, not by uh, Ministry of Foreign uh, um, Defense um, uh, official army. Uh, so um, uh, this uh, part is um, uh, was is uh, thinly guarded, and then. Um, um, what we have seen so far is at the beginning, at least the first eight or nine days, um, there was a little bit um, a lack of coordination uh, among these uh, several different uh, type of uh, armies uh, uh, who are supposed to come to um, uh, counter the um, uh, Ukraine um, uh, incursion. Right? So it took uh, Russian um, uh, eight or nine days, uh, if not, I'm not mistaken, to uh, appoint a um, uh, coordinator, supposedly a coordinator, uh, Alex, Alex, uh, Alexei Zumin, um, to be the coordinator among these uh, different uh, types of uh, military troops um, uh, to try to create a, some sort of coordination uh, mechanism or coordination center on the front line. But I think that's um, uh, a little bit uh, uh, too late uh, and shows uh, the lack of uh, sufficient coordination in the first place on the, on the Russian side. And uh, uh, one more thing is um, uh, Russian government, uh, President Putin so far still called this a terrorist, uh, an action of uh, terrorism, uh, um, possibly tried to um, uh, uh, to avoid some of the uh, uh, measures that um, uh, 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 the government has to, to, to take if it's uh, declared a um, uh, war uh, directly on uh, Russian uh, territory. So, but that also shows um, a little bit uh, of um, uh, hesitancy, hesitancy to um, to take the um, um, necessary measure to counter uh, the Kursk invasion with all the resources and um, um, measures that uh, the Russian government uh, can take. Uh, so, I would say there's a little bit of hesitancy, uh, lack of coordination are. Uh, some of the key parts of uh, Russia's early response to the to the Ukrainian incursion. Yeah. So, uh, Professor Syracuse, do you see this this hesitancy from from the Russian side? And also, uh, we hear from Zelensky that um, this incursion of the Kursk region shows that Kremlin's red lines are just a bluff. So, what does Putin consider the Kremlin's red lines, and how firm do you think those boundaries are now? Well, I, I think um, Putin um, believes he has certain red lines with Washington and with NATO. And one of these red lines is, is that uh, uh, the Ukrainians are not supposed to be using advanced weapon systems uh, on uh, the Russians uh, on, on Russian soil. The deal was, you know, the war would be fought within Ukraine. So in this sense, uh, uh, you know, the, the NATO's kind of stepping across the line, I think, um, uh, Putin is trying to figure out how to respond to this. Uh, Zelensky says in the beginning this is about a, a buffer zone. Well, that's a little rich because that's that's all Putin wanted in the first instance two years ago. He wanted a buffer zone from a nuclear-dominated NATO uh, um, security treaty, which was coming down on on Russia's borders. I mean, uh, you can't. That's that's really no story there. Uh, so I think um, Putin is trying to figure out how, how far. Uh, uh, the Biden administration and NATO is prepared to go on this. Now, there are two things going on in Washington. One is they're doing everything they can to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president because he will he will come down on Putin's side if he's elected in, uh, and goes to office in January. On the other hand, I think uh, the Biden administration has thrown the last dice, thrown all of its chips on the table to prevent a Russian victory between now and the first Tuesday in November when Americans go to the polls. So, you know, what, what we have now, more than military response, I think uh, 
Putin and the Kremlin are trying to determine what their political response should be. I mean, you know, just the lines of communication uh, and, and supply lines for the Ukrainians dooms them to death in that, that part of the world. I mean, they, they can't keep it up. They can't secure anything uh, permanently. And at the end of the day, it doesn't divert troops from doesn't divert Russian troops, it diverts Ukrainian troops from the main battle going on 200 kilometers away. So uh, in a sense, I think uh, Putin is trying to, he's, he's sort of examining uh, his political options here. And the red line that has shifted, seems to me, seems to be that NATO and, and, and Biden have, uh, have uh, got involved in this to an extent that uh, they, they're now prepared to use uh, American war material on Russian soil. Now, this is a little different from the game that we've been playing for the last two years. So I'm not worried about uh, Putin's red lines. I'm worried about how he sees America and NATO's red lines. Yeah, and actually Putin had earlier warned of possible nuclear escalation of Russian territory is attacked, although he hasn't repeated those warnings since Ukraine's incursion. So, uh, Professor Syracuse, do you see a greater risk of uh, nuclear escalation here? Absolutely. Look, I've been arguing this for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, you know, you, you hear NATO people say all the time, nuclear wars cannot be uh, won, they should not be fought. Well, actually, tactical nuclear wars can be won, and they, and they will be fought, as a matter of fact. That's why tactical nuclear weapons were developed as early as the 1950s as kind of the, uh, the great equalizer to losing uh, troops or men on the field. Uh, uh, I, I think... Uh, Putin would, would actually lean in this direction. And keep in mind that um, tactical nuclear weapons, well, we've never actually counted them. There's never been a major nuclear treaty on, on limiting or capping uh, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons in Russian military doctrine are operated and controlled by the theater commanders. There's no call at 3 a.m. in the morning to the Kremlin about to use a tactical nuclear weapon. There were over 50 of them in the uh, Cuba in 1962, and, the, and, the, and the, the commanders on the ground had carte blanche to use them anytime they wanted. So I think a tactical nuclear war becomes uh, more likely. And I'll tell you what, if, if uh, Putin wants to wipe out a, uh, a major division, Ukrainian division on Russian soil, he's got the perfect uh, uh, place to do it because no one can accuse him of uh, attacking Ukrainians and Ukrainian soil. He's repelling them from his. And these tactical nuclear weapons, the radiation fades away. There isn't permanent long term effects. And, you know, they come in very small sizes, medium sizes, but they're, they're not uh, nuclear weapons in the sense of millions of tons of TNT. They are in the thousands of tons of um, TIT. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, tactical nuclear war becomes uh, more likely. And I think uh, if uh, Biden and NATO doesn't um, get its head straightened on, uh, uh, on these matters, I think they're actually forcing Putin's hand because and this is the same way Putin got involved in the war. All he wanted was a, a, a redress of the nuclear balance of, of power. Uh, Biden wouldn't talk to him. Uh, NATO would not talk to him. And so at the end of the day, uh, he was forced to attack Ukraine with 130,000 troops which suggests to me he never wanted to attack Ukraine at all. As a matter of fact, he was bluffing. Uh, he wanted the Americans to uh, restrict the, uh, the NATO expansion of NATO, which, of course, they have reneged on for the past 25 years. Well, Dr. Hussein, what do you think are Putin's red lines? And, and, and do you think the, the, the risk of a tactical nuclear war is becoming more likely? So I think in terms of red lines, uh, from Russia's front, we've seen those change since the uh, the invasion initially began. So um, in terms of now, I'd say the red lines are confined to rhetoric. Uh, as you mentioned before, um, for a long time, the perception was that should Russian territory be attacked, it would lead to you know all bets being off. But now we've seen that despite it being attacked, despite drones being uh, directed towards uh, the capital, uh, and despite another incursion just being you know stopped, uh, Russia hasn't basically walked the talk on its threats. So I'd say the red line from uh, um, you know Putin's angle is something that uh, has constituted nuclear threats in the past, that has constituted uh, you know a global war according to uh, one of Putin's oldest allies. So I don't. So I see it being a bit of a flux, and I and I agree with Professor. For example, I think 
the broader signaling and messaging is going to be towards towards Washington. Uh, do you allow long range missiles to be used? Do you allow long range weapons to be used? Um, and to what extent do you go to test Russia's patience? I think that's going to determine whether uh, you know Russia follows through on its uh, on its on its red lines. Um, so I think. Uh, on that front, I think uh, Russia's broader goal is to ensure uh, that uh, it reaches a point where Ukraine and its Western backers uh, perceive that uh, it's in their interest to bow down and then come to an agreement which basically was being handled in Doha uh, before this incursion took place. Uh, we do know that there was going to be an agreement on not attacking energy facilities as a starting confidence building measure. Uh, for both Russians and Ukrainians uh, to lead to a potential partial ceasefire. So I think uh, Russia's uh, red lines are going to be broad rhetoric for now, uh, but I think the extent of Western engagement is going to signal whether or not uh, Russia kind of uh, follows through on those red lines. So that's one. Second, when we talk about a nuclear war, I'd say, uh, I'd, I'd beg to differ, I'd say that it's going to be more bluster uh, in the near term because Russia understands that uh, using a nuclear weapons, something that plays into NATO's own hands. Uh, NATO has been signaling this for a long time, even before, I'd say, uh, Putin had kind of escalated his nuclear rhetoric. It was like, OK, Russia has these things. It can go forward with this. Um, you know, Putin's capable of anything. And I'd say uh, Putin has kind of visited that rhetoric very, very, I'd say, with, with great discipline. He said that he, he's used nuclear rhetoric to signal to NATO when he's felt it's convenient, but hasn't followed through on it when we've seen uh, this incursion take place. So I'd say a uh, nuclear angle for me uh, would be a bit of a far-fetched thought because I think Russia has more to lose than it has to gain. Uh, and as far as red lines go, I'd say uh, the extent of Western engagement and their backing for Ukraine, including through long-range uh, missiles and weapons, is going to basically signal what Putin uh, follows through in Russia's interest. Uh, Professor Zhang, your thought on this? Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, most of uh, what uh, Dr. Hussein just just, uh, just said. Uh, I think that the likelihood uh, of a tactic nuclear weapon use is probably on the, on the rise. Uh, but uh, uh, so far, it seems that Russia understands the, uh, the stakes involved and um, uh, so far, it seems uh, to understand that uh, we'll lose more uh, rather than gain, gaining more from uh, uh, any uh, uh, reference to uh, nuclear weapon, including um, uh, tactical ones. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's my um, main point. Yeah, and, and also, Professor John, do you think Ukraine is also taking great risks by committing forces to this incursion into Russian territory? Uh, like, um, could this leave it vulnerable elsewhere where these forces might be more urgently needed? Yes, I think there's uh, definitely a um, risk, as, as you described, uh, because overall, if you look at the larger picture, uh, on the, uh, in terms of uh, personnel, uh, Ukraine is overall on a much, um, is under much more constraint. Um, the mobilization law last year was uh, uh, not very popular. Uh, it even uh, created uh, some tension between the uh, president, uh, the civilian government, and the, the military um, for, for quite some time. Uh, so um, um, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, limited the personnel. Uh, now is um, overstretched over, over even lo longer a line of contact, uh, despite the relative success, early success of the uh, Kursk inv uh, incursion. Um, and also we see some, uh, uh, just the uh, last two days, we see uh, uh, some uh, recent development in the um, Crimea region. Uh, so um, I think that uh, under a more severe um, constraint of personnel, uh, whether Ukraine is able to um, uh, sustain uh, these uh, attack or counter attacks uh, uh, now over a more extended line of contact is a big challenge for the uh, Ukrainian military. Uh, so there's uh, indeed a risk on the military side. And also a related risk is the dynamics of uh, political negotiation now is, uh, I would say, uh, flipped. At least rhetorically, we see uh, very clearly from uh, the Russian side, the uh, Russian president uh, said up front that um, uh, it makes no sense to uh, negotiate with uh, Ukraine. So that's the political risk I see. Yeah, we will discuss uh, that later. We've been talking to Dr. Zhang Xin, Deputy Director of the Center for Russian Studies at East China Normal University. Hanan Hussein, co-founder and senior expert at Initiate Futures, an Islamabad-based policy think tank. Joseph Syracuse, dean of Global Futures with Curtin University. 
Let's take a short break here. Coming back, we'll continue our discussion. Welcome back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying, joined by Dr. Zhang Xin, Deputy Director of the Center for Russian Studies at East China Normal University, Hanan Hussein, co-founder and senior expert at Initiate Futures, an Islamabad-based policy think tank, and Professor Joseph Syracuse, Dean of Global Futures with Curtin University. Professor Syracuse, do you think you know, the Kursk operation might backfire and become a trap for the Ukrainian army? And what risks do you see for Ukraine if its forces become bogged down in Russia? Oh, yeah, it, 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 it will be a trap for them. But look, I want to say something. I just want to finish a thread we were talking mm-hmm. about. About uh, one year ago, I was at a security conference in Tallinn. These small Baltic countries always have uh, uh, very important security conferences. You know, it's not like Davos, but there are a lot of important people there. And at one of the morning meetings with all these EU types in the room and diplomats and foreign ministers, I was there um, uh, talking about um, the use of tactical nuclear weapons. And the guy to my left was the Assistant Secretary of Defense in the United States in charge of nuclear weapons. And while it was Chatham House rules, that is, you know, we could talk with their, we could say what they said, but we can't really identify them. He said to this morning group under Chatham House rules, which I then reported, uh, I wrote a couple of stories for Sputnik, which were not covered in the West. Uh, he said that in response to Putin's threats to conduct a tactical nuclear war, the United States through its back channels uh, responded to Putin that in the event of a, a tactical nuclear attack, the United States would have uh, would initiate a massive bombing of Crimea and destroy the uh, Russian Black Fleet. The American response would be a massive conventional response in Crimea and the destruction of the Black... And that was enough to, uh, to uh, settle um, Putin down. Now, people do not realize that the United States takes this threat very seriously, and people have not understood in the West and I was very sorry it wasn't reported well, more thoroughly. I mean, people, of course, uh, uh, don't want to hear what goes on in Sputnik and places like that, that, um, that the Biden administration ha- has threatened, you know, destruction of Crimea and that, that, that fleet. I mean, uh, that is a very interesting, I think, angle. Maybe even our guests would like to take it up, too, uh, because the American response to a tactical nuclear weapon would be a massive sort of World War II response. Well, uh, wasn't he just saying that as some kind of deterrence, you know, when he's this kind of, you know, nuclear balance? That's exactly right. But it's never been discussed. And even the New York Times says they don't know what what the Americans would do in the event of attack. That's not true. Uh, The Americans already have a position on this. And that is they're going to bomb the hell out of Crimea and destroy the the Black Sea fleet. I mean, (laughs) they've already made it very clear in the back channels. But this is not much discussed in the West because, uh, you know, everybody's trying to pretend that uh, um, Putin is the, is the aggressor here, when in fact the Americans have responded with uh, aggression of their own, as a matter of fact. I think it's an interesting dimension to the problem. But look, to answer your original question, I mean, uh, do, you, do you think uh, uh, the Ukrainians are going to be marooned in this Kursk offensive? Uh, you know, they're in, the, they're in the region, you know, they're not up against uh, major cities yet. Uh, and as I said, the supply lines are very bad. They're supplied by very... Uh, open type roads that can be interdicted very quickly. As a matter of fact, I, as I say, I think it was a very inventive uh, thing that's going on. And I think it was um, hastened by planning by uh, by NATO forces or maybe by uh, particularly the U.S. Department of Defense has got their hand all over this. And I think it was uh, done to uh, put uh, Putin on the back foot, maybe scandalize him, uh, make him look weak, et cetera. But uh, uh, Putin is not weak as um, uh, Barack Obama made clear in 2014, uh, Vladimir Putin does not bluff. So he, he says pretty much what he's going to do, as a matter of fact. Dr. Hussein, let's look at NATO's red lines, um, because Ukraine has repeatedly asked its Western allies to allow their weapons to be used for strikes deeper inside Russia. Do you see any possibility of these restrictions being lifted? I think the the possibility is, is a bit bleak, uh, because... First of all, uh, the the amount of lobbying that we saw from Ukraine earlier on 
uh, was focused on allowing, you know, um, the West to become a bit more accommodating in terms of Ukrainian demands. And we did see that emerge this spring when the United States and other NATO countries kind of tweaked their policies and granted permission. But as of now, that's focused more along the lines of what the West describes as Ukrainian self-defense, what the West describes as, you know, short distance targeting uh, from border areas and not exactly something that would give Ukraine an open license. I think that's important because that could serve as uh, a bit of a uh, a bit of a wedge, uh, dip diplomatically speaking, uh, as the West looks to coordinate expectations among its own countries to see, okay, to what degree can we allow Ukraine to go forward with that? Because you see, uh, there's a bit of a uh, there's a bit of a projection challenge there. Um, should the West go forward and lift those restrictions entirely, um, that would also signal uh, that would be an overt expression of Western involvement in this war, something which the West has uh, sought to avoid uh, for a long time, um, thinking of ways through which it could arm Ukraine without exactly, uh, while maintaining plausible deniability. And I think that would be something that Putin would welcome and say, OK, uh, the West was behind this, now we know they're in it, and uh, all bets are off. So I'd say uh, Ukraine faces a bit of an uphill task there. Um, um, the amount of weapons and the types of weapons would still be something that NATO would go um, strongly on. But I think uh, one emerging scenario is that uh, after this incursion, Ukraine has signaled to the West that, OK, uh, one of the reasons why you didn't allow us to use weapons was because you said that uh, Russia could you know, react very strongly or that it could lead to this drastic escalation. Um, more than two weeks into the incursion, we do see that that escalation hasn't taken the kind of uh, intensity uh, that Russia had promised. And, and, I, and I think that's also important because then Ukraine can use this incursion as a proof point uh, to, to tell the West that, um, you know, this is precisely why you should uh, let us use those weapons because the red lines which you were fearing are not exactly red lines. So I'd say I would suspect um, stronger diplomatic lobbying going back and forth. We do see optimism from EU. Uh, Joseph Burrell just said that, you know, NATO should consider lifting those restrictions because, you know, it will aid Ukraine. So I'd say uh, it's going to be a bit of an uncertain um, gambling on both sides to see, okay, to what degree they can go forward. Um, but should NATO kind of lift all restrictions and give Ukraine an open pass, that would be basically an expression of escalation um, for in terms of how Russia views this and in terms of what kind of disproportionate response Moscow could entertain should those restrictions be lifted in full. Yeah, uh, so Professor Zhang, uh, actually Ukrainian officials have already stated that they've used the U.S.-made high Mars rocket systems to destroy the pontoon bridges and engineering equipment in Kursk. Does that kind of blur the lines regarding the use of Western weapons in Russian territory? And do you think this will force a reassessment of the red lines set by the U.S. and NATO? Yeah, I agree with you. I think the uh, I've been uh, arguing this uh, for quite some time. I think this this um, red line, supposedly red line, set either by the U.S. or by uh, NATO or by Western country on the limits uh, restriction of uh, uh, Western uh, West supplied uh, weapons. Uh, for uh, any attack on uh, Russian territory has been uh, actually in reality has been uh, violated for a long time. Um, and uh, look at uh, the Korsk uh, incursion, the kind of armored vehicle, the propelled, um, self-propelled uh, artillery. These are all supplied by um, uh, Western countries and they've been uh, used uh, uh, in the Korsk uh, incursion, uh, just a recent example. So I think this um, red line fit uh, had uh, actually been uh, in, in existence uh, as in, re in reality, has been uh, uh, violated for for quite some time, and um, so this line has been blur blurry uh, for not just because the the start of this uh, Korsk uh, incursion has been a blurry for quite some time. And then uh, you are right that uh, the use of um, uh, long range uh, uh, attacking uh, weapon trees uh, such as the HIMARS. Um, uh, is uh, just uh, a major example to see um, how hot blurry the, the line has been. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised that um, uh, further, uh, in reality, further uh, lifting of such uh, supposed uh, 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 earlier restriction would be uh, further lifted. Uh, and then um, uh, will be used even further into uh, uh, Russian home territory. Yeah. So, Professor Syracuse, uh, do you think the lines have uh, already been blurred regarding what kind of weapons can be used on the Russian soil? Yeah, I think they're um, 
they're not only blurring, but um, I think they've um, the NATO powers and the Americans have been probing this for a while. They keep uh, stretching um, what what can be done and what what shouldn't be done, and um, I I think um, and that's because NATO and the United States uh, regard um, uh, this war as sort of um, Russia's proxy war with them. You know, they reckon that. Uh, uh, we, we're going to stretch these things as far as we can, but uh, there are no real limits. I mean, uh, every time uh, there's a debate in Congress about what to give the Ukrainians, there's a second debate about uh, how far they can go with these things. And by the time they get these weapons in the system, you know, maybe it's even too late. So, uh, but I, I think the um, uh, NATO um, agrees that uh, I mean, NATO NATO's conduct suggests that. Uh, the lines have remained blurred, and they're going to remain blurred until the end of this war. And that is why this war has got to be brought to an end, because uh, uh, it's, it's it's reckless in many in many ways, maybe by both sides, particularly by the the Western side. And that um, there is no uh, excuse or reason to bring this level of conflict between new two nuclear powers to this level, based on um, on the case involved, because there's no justification for it. Yeah, and 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 uh, Doctor Hussein, just now you said if these restrictions are being lifted, this could be seen by Russia as some kind of um, you know escalation. But already we know that the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service has accused the U.S., U.K., and Poland of helping Ukraine plan and carry out the incursion into Kursk region, although that has been denied by the U.S. But does Russia perceive this as a NATO planned attack? with NATO weapons on its territory? And if so, could this perception broaden the threat of war, potentially leading to a wider conflict between Russia and NATO? So when we talk about um, the weapons restrictions, I think uh, it's an established fact that Western arms were used uh, in conducting this attack. Uh, and I think when you talk about uh, the escalation kind of going forward, I'd say uh, should NATO kind of decide, should the West have this stronger consensus to then have an overt display of Western arms being used um, um, by Ukraine on Russian soil, um, you know, through a, through a stronger public declaration or a greater expression of support to Ukraine, that would then give Russia greater leverage to say, okay, this is no longer an open secret. Uh, you're actually proceeding on all fronts, so let us display our option, whichever those may be. Now, coming to the NATO attack, I think at this point, um, Putin is content with signaling this as uh, a West-backed attack, which was designed to, um, you know, change some of the dynamics of this invasion. Uh, NATO's, I'd say, uh, studied silence on this is something which makes it difficult to see this as NATO's pronouncement of an open war uh, against uh, Russia through Ukraine being a proxy. So uh, the, the the story that you just alluded to, that, of course, is not just a Russian claim. It has been established. Uh, many of those, those vehicles, those weapons were used, rockets were used to fire uh, at bridges. Uh, but I'd say uh, the, the real, I'd say, bone of contention or the real litmus test is going to be to what extent does the West now knowing that Ukraine has penetrated Russian territory and gone through, uh, should it now at this sensitive stage continue to uh, to dial up its support? Because this is this is the key moment. Should it dial up its support at a time when Russia is looking at this as a huge, uh, you know, uh, this security lapse? Uh, should you go forward and, uh, you know, uh, step up your support for Ukraine in terms of weapons and loosening restrictions? That I think would could create dynamics that would enable escalation because uh, it would lead all parties to consider: okay, uh, the types of weapons being used, the type of involvement uh, from the West is something that uh, we haven't seen uh, become so uh, pronounced on Russian soil. So I think uh, this time it's going to be testing limits on Russia's front, on Western front, and uh, should the West proceed and dial up its support for Ukraine through weapons. I think that would then lead to uh, a greater declaration on Russia's part that, okay, this is NATO's involvement. So I think it'd be, it'll be observing Western behaviors very closely at this point uh, to see to what extent do they go and what are they willing to risk. Okay, so Professor Zhang, uh, to what extent do you think these NATO countries would want to get themselves involved in this, in this war? I think there's a great uh, uh, hesitancy to, uh, for most of the NATO countries to get directly involved. 
But on the other hand, there seems to be consensus that um, this is war of uh, survival for uh, European, for particularly uh, European NATO countries too. Uh, whether that perception is a correct or is a right or wrong, um, that's a different uh, issue. So uh, on the Russian side, there seems to be a similar hesitancy, right? Uh, on, on the one hand, um, uh, the, the, the perception of uh, this is a, is a NATO uh, assisted or NATO planned attack uh, was uh, confirmed by uh, Putin by several uh, top uh, Russian uh, officials. Uh, but on the other hand, this is still declared as a terrorist terrorist action on Russian territory, rather a uh, full scale invasion uh, by uh, uh, enemy country or a, um, a military group like uh, NATO. So there is, on both sides, I see a hesitancy to um, to uh, completely acknowledge that that's a face-to-face -face, uh, confrontation between NATO and uh, and Russia, um, at least for now. Okay, so uh, but Professor Syracuse, how would you evaluate the likelihood of a direct confrontation between NATO and Russia, or do you think both sides don't want to see that happen? No, they don't want to see it happen. Look, uh, neither side wants to go to war. What they want are the fruits of war, of course. I mean, they like to get their objectives realized without having to kill each other. Um, I, I, I think uh, NATO, I'm going to just uh, disagree a little bit with my colleague. Uh, I, I think NATO does, is not unanimous on what's happening in Ukraine or, or in Kursk, as a matter of fact. I've been spending a lot of time with an Italian delegation of diplomats who've uh, spent the last two years in Kiev, and I am told that the Italians are in no mood to support uh, NATO's overall proposition to come to the aid of uh, uh, Ukraine or to pick a fight with the with Russia, they're certainly not on the same level as uh, as the the Baltic states and Poland. And of course, uh, as you know, Hungary is not interested in these guys. I think NATO is uh, 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 more deeply divided than publicly noted. And I think if Trump comes in, uh, we're going to be looking at the death knell for NATO. I mean, NATO has had a very successful run. It's gone from uh, 1949 to the end of the Soviet Union, 1991, it did what it was supposed to do, and then it encroached on uh, the former Soviet states or uh, republics, taking on each one at a time. Uh, each time each one got a European uh, Union citizenship, it also uh, became a NATO member, and at the end of the day, you know, NATO became very institutionalized and uh, I think very dangerous. And of course, I'm not the only person saying this. Uh, we've had uh, French foreign ministers, American diplomats, even the former uh, head of the CIA, Bill Burns, has said the same thing. He thought that the encroachment of NATO on Russia's territories. The most interesting thing I've learned from European diplomats the last couple of years, and that's what they say behind closed doors, is they regard the war in Ukraine as a civil war. That is unfinished business between uh, uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians, who were, of course, uh, brothers in arms for for many, many years. Let's not forget that the great Leonid Brezhnev was a Ukrainian. Let's not forget that Khrushchev was born 100 miles from the Ukrainian border and made his career in Ukraine. I mean, it's it's not like uh, the uh, uh, Russia invaded some dark part of the moon. You know, it, it had a quarrel with a former uh, Soviet republic, which has was which was moving towards uh, uh, NATO and Europe in a direction that was a uh, unhappy for Moscow, and so therefore it was debatable, it was negotiable. So, you know, this uh, I think the views in NATO are far more diverse than we let on, and more diverse than the NATO leadership lets on, and I, I don't think NATO is going to survive this particular war, because at the end of the day, it has not saved, it's not done what it said it's going to do, it's not going to protect Ukraine, at the end of this, Ukraine is going to uh, have a peace settlement, which uh, they could have had two years ago, the same deal I think the NATO hand in this has been short-sighted. Short, short I think it's been aggressive, and I think it's been uh, unnecessarily dangerous in a world which, by definition, is already a very dangerous place. Okay. Well, Professor Zhang, uh, earlier, uh, as you mentioned, Kremlin said that uh, Ukraine's operation on the Russian soil has pushed the prospects of peace talks further away. And uh, they say that they're not going to talk at the current stage uh, and that further talks depend on the situation on the battlefield, including in the Kursk region. So how do you interpret Russia's current stance on uh, diplomacy? Well, uh, what you just uh, uh, cited is uh, from the official um, 
uh, announcements uh, at a rhetorical level. Um, that's what uh, I would expect to uh, to see uh, directly from the Russian government as a response to the uh, Kursk region. Right? Anything uh, uh, as a compromise at this point would regard it as um, uh, too much of a soft response, uh, almost uh, give up uh, Russia's uh, interests. So I wouldn't expect to see a, a, a different response. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the backdoor diplomacy is always possible. Uh, right now, maybe there's some some secret uh, meeting um, on both sides um, uh, is uh, happening uh, uh, right now. It's totally possible. Uh, I, and also, I wouldn't rule out uh, the possibility of a similar uh, back channel uh, diplomacy secret neg negotiation uh, uh, for the next uh, uh, few months in the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, I think that I've also met uh, uh, people uh, that uh, on both sides, on the US side, on European European side, that are uh, to different uh, uh, degree uh, uh, making great efforts, try to make those uh, uh, diplomatic uh, efforts uh, ha happen. So um, the course incursion on the surface definitely changed some of the dynamics I, I described in the past few months. Um, the in, uh, uh, interest or intention, intention to um, reopen the, the possibility of a political negotiation, but that's on the on the sort of on the open side, uh, on the backdoor channel, um, sort of the backdoor channel, the secret and the diplomacies. I think that the possibility is uh, is uh, still uh, there. Is, uh, st actually, I think it's still widely open. Okay, so uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, what do you think? Has the window for negotiation closed entirely, or do you think there are still chances for peace talks? I think uh, you know more overt or public engagement is going to be frozen in the near term because I think the pressure is a lot on Russia to respond in a way that signals that Russia is not going soft on its interests. So I agree with uh, Professor Zhang that that's going to be um, one sort of a dynamic. Right now, for example, uh, Putin is in no mood to talk, and Zelensky wants to view the incursion as a bargaining chip. It's unclear how that will turn out. Uh, but I think um, the need for uh, backdoor diplomacy is not something which is contingent on what Russia or Ukraine feels. It's just that the 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 entire invasion and the war is coming to uh, is reaching a point which is making it really really untenable for all actors that are involved. So I think that creates necessity to go forward with this diplomacy. I think uh, when you talk about um, the efforts that are taking place, I think the uh, Qataris, I would watch very closely that space, which was supposed to serve as you know a way of engaging with Russian Ukraine delegations, and you know looking at which sort of soft interests they would be willing to go with, and then create an initial consensus that okay we would limit attacks on these fronts in order to create conditions for um, you know a broader agreement in the future. But I say that the onus of responding in a way that signals that Russia is offering soften its interests is something that uh, kind of puts those things to the side. And the fact that Ukraine wants to, in some ways, um, press forward with this offensive, want more Western support going in that direction, uh, would make it very difficult to come up with a, with a more public display of doing so. So I think a shuttle diplomacy is something that's going to play a key role, may even be taking place as we speak, uh, you know, indirectly to signal what interests could we go forward with, because um, if that does not exist right now or in the near term, uh, how would all sides come to some sort of an understanding that, uh, you know, it's in their interest to de-escalate? There's no other mechanism or way to do it. All signs point towards Ukraine pressing forward. Um, the West seemingly being um, engaged in ways that they feel is testing Russia's red lines. And of course, Putin uh, buying this time, but waiting to respond. So I think diplomacy could put a floor beneath that. Yeah, well, Professor Syracuse, if there are still chances for peace talks, could this Kursk incursion, how might it, how might it alter the dynamics of any further negotiations? Like, might this offensive strengthen Ukraine's position at the bargaining table, or is it more likely to provoke an even more hardened stance for Moscow? Well, look, I, I'm sure there are uh, uh, back-channel peace talks going on. I mean, uh, there is no point in going further with this particular war. The United States has failed to uh, bring Russia to heel. NATO arms, American arms have not forced uh, Putin to give up his position. The various ways of putting pressure on uh, Russian society have be, failed. I mean, sanctions are always a failure. I mean, they only succeed 40% of the time. I mean, the Western response to 
bringing Russia to, to heel on this has been a failure. You know, we like to hear in the West that uh, Russia now grows closer to Beijing and, 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 and closer to other powers. I mean, of course, uh, it would be. But uh, I think the Americans um, realize that there's no there's just nothing, no further to go on this except uh, to come to some kind of conclusion. You know, at the end of the Vietnam War, I was a young man and we, we'd won every battle, but we lost the war because at the end of the day, it just didn't make any sense. You couldn't explain why you're killing all these people for nothing. And, you know, all these wars, whatever kind of war, we could call it a civil war or another, any kind of war, these wars always come to an end. Whether it's sooner or later, of course, is always the question. And so uh, my, my first uh, love in life, of course, is diplomacy. I prefer diplomacy over war. I don't think we use diplomacy at all to stop this war. I think we will use diplomacy, to, I mean, to stop the war in the first place. But I think we will use diplomacy to bring it con to a conclusion because there's nothing further to do. We've got this enormous loss of life, which we haven't really discovered because the Ukrainians aren't giving us their numbers. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, who's going to rebuild Ukraine? The place, they, the Ru Russian artillery has reduced the place. I mean, you know, and so we got large questions remaining. Uh, what happens next? Uh, who rebuilds the place? And of course, sooner or later, uh, Americans are going to have to sit at the table uh, with the Russians. I like to finally point out that uh, when, when we had this exchange of prisoners a couple of weeks ago, everybody talked about Putin and Americans as being very reasonable uh, uh, people about this exchange. You know, at the end of the day, Putin wasn't a war criminal. He was just a, a leader of another state engaged in international relations. And the Americans um, will, will always come to the table because uh, they have to. They live in a multipolar world. And the fact remains is that uh, Putin is a very important player. Russia is a very important player in the world to come. And we can't ignore uh, a nation uh, of that size. And with that kind of uh, military has power, it doesn't have the economic power, of course, that China has. So at the end of the day, you've got to come to some kind of uh, conclusion, because if you don't, you're actually staring in the face of reality only to your own detriment. Thank you. Thank you. We've been talking to Professor Joseph Syracuse, Dean of Global Futures with Curtin University, Dr. Zhang Xin, Deputy Director of the Center for Russian Studies at East China Normal University, Hanan Hussein, co-founder and senior expert at Initiate Futures, an Islamabad-based policy think tank. Thank you again for being with us. And that's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time. <laughs>